Hello, everyone. Since this is either a highlight, a standalone book, or the first episode in a series, I'm jumping in to remind you what the rules are for this podcast. First rule is no real people stories. That means that any details from our own lives are merely anecdotal. We do not read books about real people, and we are not reading historical fiction. The second rule is that we are basing our analyses off of how the author treats characters and what they put them through. We are not judging the accuracy of the trauma, the accuracy of any actual conditions that may be portrayed, nor the authenticity of a character's reaction to that trauma or that particular condition. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come solely from personal experience. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all audiences. Please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. Nicole. And I'm Robin, and this fortnight on Books That Burn, we're discussing Assassin's Apprentice by Robin Hobb. Let's get into our factions. We have Fisk, Burrick, Nosy the Dog, Chivalry, Patience, Lacey, Galen, Verity, Regal, and King Shrewd. For our first topic, we're going to talk about patience and betrayal, uh, specifically um, at least part of the feelings of betrayal come from finding out about her husband's infidelity uh, several years after it happened in the form of, oh, whoops, F- F- uh, Fisk exists. <laughs> so. Yeah, Patience. Patience goes through an arc <laughs> in these mm-hmm. in the in this book. I mean, to be fair, we don't see much of her on screen, but what we do is like. She starts out with this, I mean, she was betrayed. This yeah. is not a, you know, not her thinking it is, but like, she starts out dealing with that and then it, it kind of morphs into, after spoilers, I guess, chivalry dies. Um, She then comes back to the castle and wants to actually get to know Fisk and and has this like dual struggle going on where on the one hand you know she wants him to be treated well but on the other hand like he remind she he reminds her of her husband and then you know she it, it is drawn to him because she cares about him and he's a nice kid and you know from her perspective and like but then on the other hand you know he smiles and she's like oh no you are his child and like it's just this this back and forth like of of her kind of fighting because she wants to care about him but she doesn't actually want to get hurt and and it, it's you know but uh, and then the other hand she has this like kind of parallel struggle of wanting him to be treated better mm-hmm. like when she meets him she feels like responsible for him yeah like she you know like she should pick up where her husband didn't do anything <laughs> but also it's literally not her responsibility but she feels responsible, but also she can't make enough of an impact to change his trajectory. By the time she's involved in his life, he has already been training to be an assassin for several years. Well, like, she I doesn't mean, know that. She doesn't know but- that. Like her, from her perspective, his trajectory is just vaguely hanging around in the court and being burricked. And that's got to be sometimes. frustrating. 
Because, like, we know she cannot make enough of an impact to change his trajectory. Right. But I don't think she knows that. No. She's she, like, she thinks oh, my she goodness. Can. All right. You're going to be a courtly court person. I understand you're not going to, like, inherit or whatever, but you got to do the courtly court stuff. Can you dance? Can you play an instrument? What about this instrument? What about this instrument? What about this instrument? What about this instrument? Have I tried a seventh or eighth instrument? And he's like, oh, my goodness. I cannot do any of them if we only spend 20 minutes and then you get frustrated and then put a new instrument in my hands Mm -hmm. uh nicole as a music instructor is patience doing a good job of introducing someone to music no (laughs) oh i i mean (laughs) well okay on the one hand pick this up and figure out how to make sound out of it is how humans sure come up with new instruments and learn sounds and you know yeah we've got formalized education in certain things and all over the world but like you but know, yanking it away after 20 minutes is not generally yeah, recommended. Yeah, like, like yeah. oh no, you were not immediately <laughs> wonderful. Just kidding, you're terrible at this. That That is actually kind of the way to discourage somebody from doing music and how to make them not understand that doing anything well takes practice over time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Especially when it's a physical skill and something that you have to, you know, develop separate from other skills. Oh, and good for Lacey in this because oh, she is amazing. so understanding and helpful with like dealing with her mistress's like um, uh, strangeness and possible issues, but like generally like not fitting in with the rest of the court, but like having the status to get away with not fitting in with the rest of the court, but still that. Yeah. Combines to make her a very uh, complicated person to be around even though she's very nice, um, but she is like, uh, like, I mean, Lacey's great. Lacey's the one who like kind of smuggles out, you know, you're talking about instruments. Lacey's the one who kind Mm -hmm. of smuggles out an instrument for him and says, here, learn this in more than 10 minutes Mm -hmm. and come back. And she will be very, you know, happy and pleased and excited to know that you care about something (laughs) like you know, Lacey's advocating for him to Patience while Patience is getting frustrated. <laughs> yeah. And also, like, talking, giving him kind of, like, the meta conversation that mm-hmm. Patience would never think of having. Um, or would would never, like, decide to actually have, I suppose we should say. Because we don't actually get Patience's thoughts, and so we don't know that she's never thought of having it. Right. But definitely, she's not going to actually have it not at a time in his life when it wouldn't matter like i could see them talking about it like 20 years later and she'd be like oh and i tried to give you all the instruments and he'd be like yeah that 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 did not that did not help that was not a good idea (laughs) but it doesn't matter if you talk about that 20 years later if he's like this frustrated about it like now and and lacy kind of like steps into that gap and helps like um facilitate what could have been an even more stressful series of encounters where just these two people's proximity to each other is kind of stressful for both of them, like patience with like the weight of what fits, what Fisk, sorry, fits. Fits. Oh my goodness. I had it wrong in the thing. I typed it wrong. Oh no. I knew I had the name typed wrong. Anyway, what fits, um, has going on, um, just his mere existence is already stressful for her. And then her proximity to him is stressful because, like, he has, like, a vague sense that she, and a more specific sense, that she, like, wants all of these things from him. And then maybe has, an, has like, the possibility that she should expect some things from him, but also he she's not responsible. She's not his liege. She's not the one he's sworn to. And so that complicates it. I think, too, like, it's important for us to note that, like, she didn't have to ever see him. Right. Like, we've talked about her feeling responsible, but, like, this is literally the kid that her husband had when he cheated on her. And it takes her a little while, I think, to get there. But then, you know, she gets to the certain point where her reaction is, well, now this kid has no parents. And I just want to make sure that he grows up to be okay. Mm-hmm. And like, 
you know, kind of like Robin pointed out before, it's not that she has a ton of control over whether or not that happens or really any good idea of how <laughs> to make it happen. But, you know, she even like her original asking about him when she first meets him, like she's very much trying to assess, like, are you OK? Are you healthy? Are you growing up well? And like, you know, that's that's a whole thing that she didn't even have to to bother doing. She could have ensured that she never laid eyes on him ever. And yeah. instead, she she said, oh, this kid is parentless and all alone, and so am I, and let's, we should connect. Like, it's not like she thought he was somewhere else, because she no, was away she from knew the where castle for a long time, and then she shows up. Like, she had to know that by showing up, she would run into him. I mean, more than that, she knew who he was before he knew she, mm-hmm. who she was, and she sought him out and asked how he was doing. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that, like, first... That first meeting, I thought, could have been accidental, no. but everything after... Oh, it wasn't? I mean... I was trying to remember what the first she one was. She was... Uh, that was when he was drunk. <laughs> yeah. And she yeah. was asking about why and how often and, you know, kind of scolding him. And he was like, I don't know you. Yeah. But, you well, know, Patience is a good character. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> dealing with what kind of the other more powerful players have manipulated around her and controlling like her small space as much as she can but also seemingly either i don't know if she's aware that it's a small space it doesn't seem like it generally bothers her yeah but she fully fills that space to Burke and child abuse. Uh, like him as a character, but it <laughs> that is what he did. He he was abusive to Fitz. Um, and it it sucks. Uh, uh, I just I don't know. I sometimes I'm like, oh dang, I really like you as a character. You you really did that thing, didn't you? <laughs> uh, great. I go, like, oh, yeah. You did. You did the thing. <laughs> You're doing your best, but your best involved involved child abuse. Uh, so that's not great. Um, so one of the things in particular we wanted to talk about with Burrick is that he has the wit, but doesn't use it. And he punishes Fitz for using it, which fits kind of like a general paradigm of a ch- an adult punishing a child for something that the adult thinks is gross or dirty and they personally either fully abstain from or try to abstain from but also are completely able to do and might want to do and that kind of gets directed onto the child like all of that like anger and self-loathing and that can fit a a ton of different things um applies to just there's a bunch of different times that this can happen and in this particular case it's with this fictional magic, this magical ability that they both have, which is part of why Burke like immediately recognizes it in Fitz and then wants to stop him from doing it to the point that like when Fitz is uh, almost an adult, as we would say it, and I think is an adult uh, in terms of how his society is treating him because he's like 17, 18 right. by the time the book ends he fits is like okay well great um here's where we are and i'm my own person now and part <laughs> of me being that part of me being like a person who is good at stuff and doesn't hate every moment of my existence is that i use this thing and burke is like well I guess it's better that we're not friends anymore and haven't been for a long time and we're just We can't, I can't get over this. I can't get, Burke can't get over Fitz using this thing that Burke thinks is horrible. Um, And there's some of the, some of the examples that Burke tries to use as cautionary tales to get Fitz to stop um, are clearly things that Burke has done that he hates that he has done. Like they're kind of, you know, like the suspiciously specific example um like oh you know you're gonna 
bring the thoughts of that your animal has to bed when you're with your partner. And I'm like, oh, Burke, that's, oh, no, you definitely (laughs) did that and don't like it. That's a very specific thing for you to call out, sir. You're like, I'm like, Fitz is eight, Burke. (laughs) Why? I mean, also, Burke's uh, assumption that practicing the wit means you won't be able to practice the skill. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no reason to think that. There's no reason to think that. You could have been dual wielding magic in a metaphorical sense. Yeah. And, yeah. And Fitz is living proof at a certain point that, like, no, that's not how that works. (laughs) Right. It doesn't stop it. And you can do both. Yeah. Like, they're just two different things. He has two different magical heritages. And Burke is like, nah, the one that we both have is terrible. Um, yeah, and it just, it, it fits this kind of, you know, general, I mean, there, there's this thing where, like, it's easier to spot in someone else the thing that you don't like about yourself, but, and this is that, right. like, turned up, like, a lot, um, and it's got, you know, the hypervigilance from thinking this is really shameful, but, like, th- like, I don't, it's, I believe, Burrick, that it's been bad in the past for people with the wit. Right. But... As far as Fitz's experience during this part of his life, <laughs> the only person saying anything about the wit or saying that it's bad is Burrick, this person who also is responsible for feeding clothing and raising him for like this very um, vulnerable portion of his life before he like starts learning stuff from other teachers and before he has this rift with Burrick. Okay, I think here's the bit where we should talk about the animal death. So if you've been cool with the discussion until now, I'd like to skip out. We're going to talk about uh, whether or not a dog dies. So there's that uh, warning there. Okay, so Nosy is the first dog that Fitz bonds with um, when he's, he's a kid. And, you know, he sees through nosy and nosy understands things through fits and Burrick sees this and is uh, horrified and repulsed by it and does this like thing to figure out for sure whether or not they're bonded or whether they're just close. So he basically, he, he does this thing that allows him to determine that, yes, Fitz under, a uh, nosy understands things that were told to Fitz in a way that there would be no reason for nosy he, to be able to understand. He lies just, to Fitz. Yeah. And then try, shows nosy a thing and nosy reacts as though that thing were dangerous, which is not true, but it was a lie that he told Fitz. Yep. Uh, yes. And then Burrick separates them and severs fits and nosy yeah Um, this was a thing where this is our big major clue that burrage also has the wit because fitz is right to assume that nosy died because Uh there's oh yeah he doesn't have context for another way that their connection could have been severed and like we kind of get proof later that you know distance is not going to do it alone Right. Um, but Burrage having the wit and cutting it off. <laughs> yeah, Nicole's extremely plausible theory uh, is that Burr used the wit to sever Nosy and Fitz's connection. And as soon as you said it when you were talking to me about it before the record, I was like, oh, no, that's completely what happened. Like, the book never says that explicitly, um, but that's... I... Now that you've pointed it out, I think it even seems like it might even be heavily implied. Oh, I, just, I think it is heavily implied. Yeah. But I, I, I think in kind of a breadcrumb kind of way where if you don't have context from later events, you're not going to piece it together the first time reading it. I think it's very well done. Mm-hmm. But I, th- I yeah. think it's, you know, very much handed to us as an audience. And I'd read this before. It just had been like a decade. I had read mm-hmm. a bunch of things in this extended universe of books. Um. I'd read this maybe once a while ago, and so this was almost like I'd read it the first time, (laughs) you know? Yeah. Yeah. But but that, the way it was done was so sudden and painful that 
Fitz couldn't interpret it any other way than that Nosy was dead and Burrick had killed him. Right. And when they have this um, kind of attempt at a reconciliation, like, or at least a talking through of the issues, and then it does not end up being reconciliation, um, around a decade later, uh, when Fitz is a young adult, um, Burrick kind of has this understanding of like, oh, that's why, that's why you were suddenly so withdrawn and sullen. You thought I killed your dog. I, I don't know what to do with the fact that you thought that I, the master of the counts, was the kind of person who would kill your dog for your mistake. Yeah. And they, I think Burke just has to kind of like sit with that. I that mean, he, he immediately turns around and says, but me, you thinking I would do that means that you, you, were, you didn't stop what you were doing. So you're still mm-hmm. dead to me. Goodbye. Like he doesn't even take time. Oh, yeah. You, yeah, you, th- you, you thought that your dog could die because of this and did die because of this and you didn't even stop. Oh, you are actually more disgusting than I thought you were because you kept doing this disgusting thing, even though the price was your dog dying. Um, yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, that's right. He immediately turns it back around and kind of makes it his fault, not even just his fault, but like an even deeper indictment of him. And of this perceived flaw in his character. It's very much also a thing that, like, Burge clearly thinks that you can just ignore. But then uh-huh. we see, but the fact that we see evidence of, like, him not only just, you know, using it for things, but knowing what to do in certain situations with it, like, you know. And and also, like, Burge is a character who canonically drinks a lot. <laughs> I was about to say. Like, it's very, it, you, we're given a lot of hints that, like, it's very easy to interpret that, you know, no, you can't, but Burrich has tried to drown that part of him in a, in several ways. Yeah. Like, I mean, because if, if part of the thing is being connected to all these animals and part of the thing with alcohol is, is like, it is feeling numb um, and less connected in this particular way then he might be literally trying to drown out his talent with the alcohol um, and or guilt over being unable to drown it out with alcohol. He's drowning something. Yeah. So. On to Galen and emotional abuse. So... I mean, specifically, this is magically enhanced emotional abuse and kind of like magical compulsion grooming in a context that feels a whole lot like a little cult and um, and magical compulsion. Mm hmm. Yep. Magical compulsion um, using magic to hasten a kind of gaslighting, you know, achieving with magic very quickly the kind of stuff that can uh, non magically be achieved through gaslighting over like a little bit longer of a period of time. So one of the things that happens is he tries to make Fitz kill himself. Um, And backing that up with magic to um, make him believe that he is worthless and should. Um, And also using magic to make Fitz think he doesn't have the skill when using the skill is the entire point of him being around Galen, like, at all. So I mean, it's got to be this, fair, like, Galen is the only one they are allowing to test him on it. This is true. So he can just lie and nobody finds out for a while. Right, but, like, here's the thought that I had. Uh, because if Fitz didn't have the skill and it was completely worthless and he couldn't do it at all, like, then there's no reason for him to be around Galen. And now, you but know, he would the have reason been... Galen doesn't actually want him to not be there at all, except through death, was because he did have the skill and Galen needed to See, make this... him think he didn't. But like, This I is was where you and logic. I disagree. <laughs> I, was, I was going, like, suddenly very logical, and I was like, well, fine, if Galen's right, then... Fitz doesn't need to be around him at all, and he could just go away. But that's not actually what Galen's trying to achieve, and so that's, like, not... Well, 
what happens and not how it goes. (laughs) Yeah, and then that wouldn't even, I mean, we don't even know that, actually. Yeah. Like, for hashtag spoiler reasons that I'm not going to get into because it'll we're yeah, not yeah. spoiling that section. Like we, there are other reasons that Galen straight up disliked Fitz even before this. Oh sure, there's yeah, yeah, that yeah. we don't actually know that Galen would not have been around him or wouldn't have been an instrument used against him. Like we don't know that. <laughs> no, no, I I just mean that like if someone shows up to be an instructed in a thing is literally completely physical una- physically unable or mentally unable or whatever the thing is, completely unable to ever have any shot at doing the thing. And then both parties are like, yeah, there's no way I'm going to do the thing. In any other like non beusific circumstance, you could just then stop trying to learn how to do the thing. I, but since yeah, but that's that wasn't not the point. actually what Galen's trying to accomplish. I was yeah. just like thinking through it and going, oh, no, it's completely a mindfuck. Like, it's, it's, like, it's just, it's just bad. And it's, and it's abusive. Um, just, uh, it's just really awful. Um, I don't know if you had, like, some big other thing you wanted to say about this and, like, how the emotional abuse is portrayed. Um, I mean, mostly just, like, the... It's very much an opportunity attack. Mm-hmm. Like, we we find out, you know, through conversations later that getting rid of him, uh, getting rid of him is is kind of a goal, or the goal. Um, and it's just like you know, Galen kind of seizes the moment and does it in a way that he he tries very hard to make it look. I was almost going to say organic, natural, logical. Yeah. And I was also thinking in terms of, um, and like, we'll, you know, we'll rate this later in, in the wrap up, but like, while I can talk about it with spoilers, with how the author was framing this, uh, this emotional abuse and gaslighting and all these just like, just lies at right. a point in the book where the author, where, like, the reader is also, like, learning about this thing and learning how it works, the juxtaposition between what was happening to Fitz then and the right. narration of his older self in the framing device, like, giving context and, like, talking about the the broader arc of this abuse rather than having three months of descriptions of individual instances of right. this it's very brutality. Good framing. Yeah, it's really, really good framing. And it, I mean, merely the, the, that the narrative device is what it is, which is him like 30 ish, at least years in the future past the events, like decades on. Um, right. Talking about it means that we know he lives, but we don't know anything other than that. <laughs> and we know that he, uh, like in the framing device, He's had a very bad life. We just don't know how much of that life is going to happen in in this book. Like how much of that bad stuff that makes him a a much more broken person in his older age. And but the the way it the way the author interwove um uh, specific exactly as much description it was as was necessary, but like I think not more was very good because it lets what was several months of a very hellish experience for Fitz be just a few chapters, leaving enough of the emotional weight and a few using skillfully a few really, really specific instances of really bad stuff, like the attempt to get Fitz to commit suicide, um, to kill himself, um, rather than... Um, rather than having like three months, right, of a detailed just slog of awful, um, yeah, because you know I've, I've read books that would do that slog, right, and it's a very different kind of book that up until this moment this book hadn't been, and so if it had veered <laughs> into that, it it would have it would have been a lot, um, and I'm glad the way the framing device worked helped to keep it be there. And because it was the framing device, 
it meant that you didn't need to like go in and like specially do any kind of like distancing and care in this section. Like, no, like they already had this, this thing of like older fits occasionally commenting on things. And so it wasn't like present, 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 present. Oh, I'm here for the future to say I'm going to be fine. Present, present, present. <laughs> it would, <laughs> you know, like, it, it, you know, fits much more naturally. It is part of the, how the rhythm of the book has been up until now. And so it just works really well. Uh, yeah, it's opinion. very smooth. And it takes a lot of care with the reader just inherently. Yeah, it's like one of my, um, it is not my favorite section of the book, but it is one of the points where I was able to most um, be excited about the structure and how that fit the story. Yeah, that makes sense. Hey there, Screen Beans. Have you heard about Screen Snark? Rachel, this is an ad break. They aren't screen beans until they listen to the show. Fine. Potential screen beans. You like movies and TV shows, right? I mean, who doesn't? Screen Snark is a casual conversation about the movies and television shows that are shaping us as we live our everyday lives. That's right, Matt. We have a chat with at least one incredible guest every episode, hailing from all walks. We've interviewed chefs, writers, costumers, musicians, yoga teachers, comedians, burlesque dancers, folks in the film and TV industry, and more. We'd be delighted for you to join us every other Monday on the Certain POV Podcast Network. Or wherever you get your podcasts, fresh and tasty off the presses. What? But that's... No, that's not... Can I call them Screen Beans now? Fine. Screen Beans! So tune in and we'll see you at the movies or on a couch somewhere. Because you're a whole Screen Beans now. You will be mine. On to the wrap-up and ratings for Assassin's Apprentice. Uh, I'd like to note, in case you heard the character list and then jumped here, I originally said that the main character was Fisk. Uh, It's Fitz. Uh, Whoops. (laughs) Sorry about that. Anyway, so, with Fitz starring in this book, for our gratuity rating for Betrayal, uh, the betrayal is backstory and like the fallout from it, I think is either mild or moderate when, when we're just talking about how the betrayal intersects with patients. With patients specifically, I would say it's moderate. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think it's, <sighs> it's hard because we see a lot of effects from it. Mm hmm. But you kind of have to put them in context, but they're very yeah. definitely there. Yeah, but it isn't. It is not overall a book about how this betrayal affected patients. Fitz's no. entire life exists because of it. So, yeah. like, that's the reason we talked about patients that way. It could be like an actual manageable conversation and not just a shoves book into hands. Read this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, we're talking about our minor character. Sure, is sure. What is yeah. happening? But. Yeah. Yeah, I I think I think it's moderate. I think I think if this were a book from or about patients from patients's point of view or about her, I think mm-hmm. it would immediately jump up to severe um just for effect on the character. But I think because this is a book a book about Fisk Fitz, now I'm Fitz, doing it. Yeah. <laughs> um I I think it is moderate. Yeah. All right, the child abuse um this is severe it's it's severe um yeah yep and it's severe in a way that i think i mean nobody is going to have the exact trauma that this character goes through but i think if you have lost things (laughs) without spoilers um I, th- I think if you have a trauma surrounding pet loss or surrounding sudden separation anxiety things this is likely to hit harder. Yeah. Or if you have trauma around some of the things that, you know, you could, this will feel similar to, like if you have um, 
trauma from your family being a certain way and you are that way and they tell you to stop of, for any reason, really. Yeah. Um, it's it's very easy to, to see yourself in this character, I think. So that mm-hmm. is probably going to hit harder, too. Yeah. And, and that is left ambiguous on purpose because I think that can be a myriad of things. <laughs> so. Yeah. Uh, emotional abuse. Definitely severe. It's severe. Yeah. I would say the only thing that doesn't push this into torture porn category is that we are absolutely supposed to feel bad for this character. We are not supposed to buy into it. Right. Yeah. A a lot of work is done in the framing to help not pull the reader in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but still, um, the depiction is severe. For the trauma integral interchangeable or irrelevant for the um, betrayal integral ah um, <laughs> uh, we didn't need to see patience's aftermath but the trauma itself is like kind of okay the whole character i have a counter i have a counter okay um the point is that fitz exists because his father slept with someone he doesn't he wasn't married to that didn't necessitate him being married to a someone else who then was betrayed. No, it. That's it my did big though. Interchangeable. I'm not going to go as far as irrelevant. Okay, I I think it did though because you think a patience like character had to be there and to be hurt in order for the trajectory of the book to exist. Yeah, okay. yeah, because there was a whole thing where you know if he wasn't married there was a whole conversation at one point which was basically like well you know if if chivalry wasn't married then he could just claim this kid as his heir but he can't and so Mm. it's created this whole problem okay i'll go with integral the child abuse is it's integral uh i think i think are you gonna argue this is hard I think you can make an argument for integral or interchangeable. I think I like this part of the book, which makes me want to call it integral. <laughs> um, but I, I think the thing that it surrounds could have been replaced with something else. Okay. Especially in book one. I think it's interchangeable, but very good. Okay. All right. Uh, and then the emotional abuse. That's integral. De- well, hmm. or interchangeable. No, that's interchangeable. Yeah. Like... Yeah, a lot of people don't like him, but not all of them tried to do this or needed to have tried to do this. But like something bad. Uh, it It is appropriate to the arc of the book that something bad with vaguely this shape happened. Yeah. Uh, care. Betrayal. The betrayal, I... I think enough. Yeah, I'm going to go with enough because it's either enough or yes. So I'm comfortable I, saying it's enough. enough. <laughs> I think there was a lot of things that made it enough. Yeah. The child abuse. Mm, uh, I think either not enough. I'm going to say I'm going to say not enough. Um especially because of the way it intersects with another um high stress trope that or high stress uh thing that we discussed in in that topic. Um, because of, especially because of the way that the reader is also led to think a certain thing for a long time, um, in a yeah. way that is stressful reading. Yeah, I that's fair. That, yeah. So I'm going to say not enough. Emotional abuse. I'm going to say enough. Um, I think this is one of those where it's enough, but if there was any more care taken it would not have been actually communicated to the reader what was happening um and it also has some that topic has some again like associated much more stressful things that i think are handled with enough care yeah but can be very stressful this one is maybe a your mileage may vary topic yeah it- uh and then po oh moral directionality the more directionality, I'm going to go is with... ambiguous. Uh, you think this is muddy? I was going to go with either muddy or tangled. I, I think that we as a reader are handed kind of a weird setup here because everybody has, or almost everybody seems to have very tight reasons for what they do. But a lot of the things that happen in the book are like objectively the thing that we are 
led to believe objectively is bad. So, you know, when it comes to like you're looking at the, let it, it situationally, I think everything people do makes more sense. And, I, and so I think that makes it muddy. I think different characters have corrected like what the book tells us are good objectives. Oh yeah, how well things work out for them has yeah. nothing to, has nothing to do with whether or not they had clear objectives or we ought to Yeah, maybe and and agree characters that we anything. are supposed to root for are the ones who kind of take a lot of the hits in this series. Um I think I don't remember is muddy or tangled worse. <laughs> or mi- which um, one's in the middle? The one in the middle. Oh, so uh, clear is there's really one direction and we have a really like obvious thing for it. And then which one's um, in the middle? The muddy is the middle one. Muddy is the middle. Okay. I think this is tangled. I think. Okay. I think that yeah. the book tends to punish the characters that we would think of as doing better things and tends to reward everybody else. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. All right. And then POV. I mean, it's it's Fitz, but it's complicated because it's old Fitz and young Fitz. It's actually, actually, it's all the way old Fitz. It's just him, him contextualizing thinking about a memories. particular time in his life. Yeah, but it but it's all the one character. We just get yeah. the one one POV. Yeah, with a little bit of the framing pulling back to show literally what's in the room around him. And that's bit of the what's that's the framing that we're being given. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then for the trope spotter, uh, let's go with meaningful name. There's a lot of stuff with (laughs) names in this, uh, including like a long period of time where like no one has bothered to give him a name because uh, his because because he's a bastard and they just no one's bothered to name him, or if they did, he doesn't remember it when he ends up with the royals. Yeah. So even Fitz is a name. Like, Fitz chivalry is like bastard son of chivalry. Like, yeah. He, his, his meaningful name is, well, you're here because of what your dad did. Right. Like, yeah. Now, what is your... Okay, as the rain intensifies behind me, uh, <laughs> what is your favorite non-traumatic thing about the book? I like I like the animal bonds. I like the wit in general as a concept. I think it's cool. And I I Okay, I like that there's a secret passageway. <laughs> okay. I just it's cool. I like that there's a secret passageway where he goes to learn like particular uh thing uh, after traversing a secret passageway. Like I just, you know, I like that as a thing. That's cool in like a building. And so yeah. that's fun. It also like starts me thinking about things like, oh, like whoever assigned him to be in this room, he was assigned this room so that the passageway could happen like somewhat later but not a huge amount of time anyway it just got me thinking about a bunch of like machination type things all right my audio i think might be unusable from this point so if you could uh do the sign off i'd appreciate it in case i'm unintelligible all right uh robin's audio is a little bit uh being drowned out by rain Uh, So we will see you all in a fortnight. All music used in this podcast was created by Nicole as Heartbeat Art Co. and is used with permission. Our transcriptionist is Heather. Follow her on Twitter at MamaDragon20. We're proud members of the Certain Point of View Network. Find all the CPOV shows at www.certainpov.com. You can contact us on Twitter at Books That Burn or by email at Books That Burn at Yahoo.com. Please consider leaving us a tip at Kofi.com slash Books That Burn or becoming a monthly supporter on Patreon.com slash books that burn all patrons get access to our upcoming book list bonus content including the second half of all interviews and will receive a one-time shout out 
To get updates on our written reviews, recent episodes, and newly completed transcripts, subscribe to our fortnightly newsletter at buttondown.email slash books that burn. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please leave us a review wherever you're listening. This helps people to find the show. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks.